The Thomas Mann House itself will, will be a residence, but the mandate, as you heard this morning from the president of Germany, is for the scholars, and I hope also artists and activists uh, from Germany, um, to go out into the United States in various ways, not simply to be in retreat at the, at the Thomas Mann House. Uh, the mandate was to address the most critical issues facing uh, the world right now. I think Nikolai and I together uh, have concluded that at least among them, and I personally think the two most serious issues are global warming, which we're not in a position to do anything about, um, and the future of democracy, where we in fact may be able to make some small contribution. Uh, this conference really probably should have been called a colloquium. It's more of a set of public presentations than it is about active problem solving together. But in the future, uh, in part based on the notes we've taken today in these discussions, we'll be identifying uh, focused issues within the larger subject of the future of democracy um, and be devoting real energy to both the selection of residents who, who, from Germany who are expert in those issues and bringing them together with their peers uh, from the United States and with audiences around, around the United States. I know two of the issues that are already on the agenda, uh, we are gonna take up the subject of over time of homelessness, uh, which is pure, uh, clearly in part about who's being left out by uh, the current arrangements and also issues of artificial intelligence and what that will mean uh, for the, the human life uh, that will have to live with the artificial intelligence and what that will mean in terms also of the future of democracy. So this is just a beginning and I have to say from my notes I've taken so far, we have, we have wonderful clues about where to go next. Um, th this panel really took its lead uh, from a book by Saskia Sassen called uh, Expulsions, about the extent in the world today in which whole populate, whole, is this working still? Yes. Now it is. The extent to which whole populations are being written off as unnecessary. Um, in Los Angeles, we live it every day with the scale of homelessness. Uh, and a kind of acceptance that it's okay if people are homeless. We maybe should have a few more toilets, but otherwise that's just the way it is. Uh, around the world we're finding this, uh, various versions of uh, populations being rendered, being eliminated or pushed out or rendered, uh, just forgotten. Also now Miramar, you can also kill them. <laughs> um, we are gonna start from uh, this larger issue of how we find common ground, but in the context of a world where there are huge economic pressures toward um, just the removal of large parts of the world's population. Um, with that, I will sit down, and um, have we decided among ourselves who goes first? I, I'm delighted to have Ananya Roy here. She's one of the first, she is the director of the Institute on Democracy and, Equal, and, in, and Inequality at the Luskin uh, School of Public uh, Policy at UCLA. She's one of the very first people I sought out as we started down this adventure uh, to learn from, and I look forward to what I'm gonna learn next. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for still being here with us at the tail end of this important day. I'm thrilled to be here um, with Stephen and with colleagues I greatly admire. You will get to meet them quite soon. I'm going to focus the conversation today on the broader theme of expulsions, which is the theme of this session. Last year, during the inauguration of Donald J. Trump as the 45th President of the United States, the Institute on Inequality and Democracy at UCLA Luskin, which I direct, uh, 
issued a call to educators to take a stand against the institutionalization of white racial domination in elected government. Titled Teach, Organize, Resist, our day of action spanned the country. From statements of educational values, such as the Campus Sanctuary Declaration by Cal Arts, which Stephen at that time headed, to pedagogies of resistance, the endeavor was meant to signal our refusal to bear silent witness to the re-emergence of fascism. One important voice that day was poet Erica Sanchez, who joined us at UCLA to read from her debut collection, Lessons on Expulsion. I'd like to start my brief presentation this afternoon with her words. This is an excerpt from her poem titled Crossing. The images you will see are from a collection titled The American Dream by Thomas Kiefer, who worked as a janitor at the Customs and Border Processing Center in Ajo, Arizona. His art curates the confiscated personal belongings of migrants who have been detained or deported. Crossing. My parents leave the land blooming with dust, locusts, their long hair trailing behind them into the wet flesh ochre of the desert. Ghost flowers, Spanish needles, north. Right there across the river, there are all kinds of magical instruments, and we keep on living here like donkeys. And we keep treading on the wires. They move through turbid water, air thick with mosquitoes. Sometimes coyotes are not desert wolves. They're men with mustaches, mirrored sunglasses, who shove my shivering parents into the trunk of a Cadillac, who study my mother's wet startled body. In Chicago, we live in basements. The rattle of heaters, jaundiced paint, the smell of beans boiling, breaking their skin, everything fried up in pig grease. The roaches make nest in our toys. One makes its way inside my shoe and comes out in school. Another crawls inside my brother's ear to start a home until my mother drowns it with alcohol. I exist because you see me. You will not work like us. You will not work like a donkey, my mother says, in factory heat, the murmur of machines. This afternoon, as we contemplate the theme of expulsions, I would like to put forward three propositions regarding the relationship between democracy and space. The first is the stark reality of socio-spatial inequality vividly manifested in our cities. Here in the City of Angels, not very far from where we are at this moment, in the hills of Bel Air, is the country's most expensive home a property known as The One, with a market price of $500 million. And here in the City of Angels, in Skid Row, not very far from us, thousands of women, men, and children live on the streets or are corralled into warehouses masquerading as shelters. Such inequality has been systematically produced, from policies of taxation that enable the hoarding of wealth to those that criminalize poverty, liberal democracy reproduces inequality. Now, what we're witnessing in our cities is something much more severe than displacement. It is dispossession. It is what I term racial banishment. From bans on vehicle dwelling and quality of life tickets that target the houseless, to nuisance ordinances that are used to evict the precariously housed, what is at work are the public means of expulsion, of black and brown communities being banished from the city and from the core spaces of democratic life through the police power of the state. My second proposition then is this, that we cannot talk about expulsion without taking explicit account of the racialized logic of dispossession. The forced removal of people of color, as Professor Kim reminded us in the previous session, is not new. 
It is part of the long history of settler colonialism, slavery, and imperialism. The border then is everywhere, made and remade in neighborhoods, in homes, in Erica Sanchez's words, in flesh threaded with desert. The current historical conjuncture, notably the resurgence of right-wing populisms and chauvinist nationalisms here in the United States, in Italy, in India, activates and repurposes such histories to spectacular effect, designating racial outsiders against whom white supremacy wages war. My third proposition follows from this. Liberal democracy entails the practice of what Michel Foucault famously called biopolitics, the management of human life, from healthcare to social welfare, from schools to asylums, the institutions of biopolitics generate their distinctive forms of differentiated inclusion. But what the philosophers of modernity often miss, and that scholars of colonialism remind us of, is the relationship between biopolitics and necropolitics. Necropolitics, as Ashila Mbembe argues, is the ultimate expression of sovereignty, and it resides in the power and capacity to dictate who may live and who must die. The outrage over children ripped from their parents at Trump's border is vitally important. This image has gone viral. But the practice of family separation is not new. From the tearing apart of enslaved families to the forcible placement of Native American children in so-called Indian schools, social death has long been a part of American life. And is it different across the Atlantic? Nicolas de Genova insists that if we are to think of Europe, we have to do so at the threshold of Europe, where Europe's colonial present becomes visible. That threshold, he notes, is made up of a series of externalized border zones, including the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean today, in de Genova's words, is a mass grave. This image, too, went viral. But I'm not content with these propositions. At the Institute on Inequality and Democracy, we have insisted that the analysis of racial capitalism must lead to visions and propositions that make possible what my comrade at UCLA, Robin D.G. Kelly, has called freedom dreams. And so let me now quickly share three more propositions. The first is that we must find solidarity with the extraordinary movements striving for racial justice, those that President Steinmeier mentioned in his talk earlier today. In particular, the movement for black lives has exposed what Paul Gilroy once described as the practical raciology of fascism. That raciology, Gilroy argued, was often apparent in industrialized killing. Black Lives Matter has made visible the extrajudicial killings of black men by the police. Let's just call these lynchings. But it has also put forward a bold plan for reparation, reconstruction, and redistribution. It has insisted, as did Thomas Mann at the height of an earlier fascism, that democracy is the inalienable dignity of humankind. Man writes of the relationship between freedom and justice and truth. He saw this to be the complex of an indivisible kind. The prominent movements of our time are precisely these. They are grounded in the truth of communities and shaped by the legacy of anti-colonial freedom struggles. My second proposition returns us to the question of inalienable dignity. In the United States, where mass incarceration has become a key instrument of racialized state power, such inalienable dignity is simply not possible. Los Angeles is the carceral capital of the country, I'm not sure how many of you know this, spending $1 billion a year on incarcerating people. 
Today is Juneteenth, and it is therefore worth thinking about the unfinished work of emancipation in the United States. Abolition democracy is not just the end of the prison industrial complex, it is not just the abolition of ICE, it is not just um, the end of mass incarceration, rather it is about the end of the logic of slavery, the end of social death, the end of political disenfranchisement, the end of human caging. At UCLA, our students have insisted on abolitionism as a guiding vision for the reconstruction of democracy. From abolitionist urban planning to the Underground Scholars Initiative that supports formerly incarcerated men and women who are now UCLA students. They demonstrate to us how all our spaces of knowledge, how all our professional organizations can take up the mandate of abolition. My third and final proposition is this. The coming victory of democracy, of which Thomas Mann writes in 1938, is not necessarily going to be found in the North Atlantic. President Steinmeier this morning reminded us of the ways in which Thomas Mann reflected on American democracy, and so democracy and America as synonyms. I'm arguing that the coming victory of democracy, the future of democracy, lies in the populous democracies of the global south. It is there that we see vast new programs of human development, social protection, and redistribution. From the right to housing to universal basic income, the global south gives us a glimpse of forms of social democracy that are far out of reach in the west. The story there is not that of benevolent governments. It is the story of collective action by poor people who are also the political majority in these countries. Their demands and claims hold governments accountable and ensure the coming victory of democracy. So let me conclude then with these images from my ongoing ethnographic research on the outskirts of Kolkata, India, the city where I was born. There, a slew of government programs promise improvements in homes and services for slum dwellers. Government records are filled with the thumbprints and photos of beneficiaries. But these are not relationships of gratitude. These government programs are neither handouts nor gifts. They are a social contract between governments and citizens. Come into my home, demanded Manju one afternoon. Photograph the water leak. Photograph the uneven foundations. You see how the work wasn't done well by the state contractor? I'll make sure it gets fixed, she says. You just take the photographs. It's my right, she said, to a good home, to the proper services. Thank you. There is such a strong connection between what Ananya just said and the research and work of our next two participants that I'm going to introduce them and go directly to that, and then we'll turn to questions. Fona Foreman is professor of political science and director of the Center on Global Justice at University of San Diego. She works cooper collaboratively with the architect and also professor at University of California, San Diego, uh, Edwin, although none of us call him Edwin, uh, Teddy Cruz. Uh, welcome and uh, take the stage. <laughs> We're delighted to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, for Thomas Mann in the 1930s, speaking about democracy to Americans was like carrying owls to Athens, he said, a place that has lots of owls. Um, in other words, the European had little to teach uh, the American for whom democracy uh, was what he called univer a universally ingrained conviction. But he also understood that even the Americans could not rest on their laurels, that democracy needed continual renewal, reaffirmation against emergent threats, and crises. And 
you know, no lesson uh, could be more important for us now when the human rights of immigrant populations everywhere are in jeopardy. It's impossible to begin a discussion of expulsion, urban borders, and democracy without asserting clearly um, our global commitment to human rights to reassert this, um, and particularly the right of asylum for those escaping cruelty, persecution, violence, poverty, and the devastating impacts of climate change. We need to recover the foundations of international human rights norms and our global responsibilities to what Grotius called the stranger in distress. As Zaid al Hussein, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, reminded us yesterday when talking about the activities right now on our southern border, human beings don't lose their rights the moment they cross a border. Too many cities across the world have been swept up in the nativist panic, but while the racist uh, rhetoric ratchets up, many other cities have declared themselves sanctuaries for immigrants and fortresses of resistance against national mandates and propaganda that criminalize the most vulnerable people on our planet. We live and work at the US-Mexico border uh, in the largest binational urban region in the world, the metropolitan, uh, the metropolis of San Diego and Tijuana. The current political climate in the US strikes a particularly urgent chord in a region like ours, where the prototypes for Trump's beautiful wall were built, and where public debate over immigration and the fate of dreamers gets very real. While ICE, the immigration and Customs Enforcement Wing of UN Homeland Security is formally constrained by law and protocol. There are many stories every day of egregious human rights violations, mass sweeps, entry and seizure without warrant, the detention of minors in adult facilities, and of course now, the forced separation of migrant children from their parents. For immigrant communities living in the US, the proximity of the border wall means that illicit, extra-legal deportation can take a matter of minutes. Men and women who have lived and contributed in countless ways to their communities in the US over the past decades are enduring waves of public hatred toward them, their children, and are terrorized by the proverbial knock at the door. Fear of political oppression and deportation has produced unprecedented anxiety in the immigrant communities of San Diego County. Of course, the rhetoric of the criminal immigrant has become ubiquitous across the globe, from Brexit to Fortress Europe, and the resurgent of far-right nationalist movements across Europe. In fact, the nativist mentality that once characterized the political fringe has gone mainstream, legitimizing open racism in Europe, not seen since the middle of the 20th century, and an urge to build walls that are higher, stronger, and to protect national resources from an endless flow of violent parasites. We believe that uh, at bottom, this is a cultural crisis, as the dynamics, uh, these dynamics are rooted in the, erosions, uh, in the erosion of social and public ways of thinking with physical implications in the city, shaping or uneven urbanizations across the world. Ultimately, this pertains to the unaccountability of institutions to engage deepening social and economic inequality. This is one of the most critical issues, in fact, that characterize the border region where we live and work. At no other place in the world, we can find some of the ex most expensive real estate in the planet, as the one found in the ages of San Diego, barely 20 minutes away from some of the poorest slums in Latin America, as the ones that we found in the periphery of Tijuana. This radical proximity between sectors of mega wealth and size of precarity and poverty is emblematic of uneven urbanizations everywhere. In our practice, we engage the visualization of inequality, the visualization of conflict as creative tools. The research on American inequality that Emmanuel Saez and Thomas Piketty developed years ago is one of those visualizations. Two lines that bend across time and mirror each other. Two peaks on both ends and a valley in the middle. On the line above these two peaks, 
represent moments of the largest income inequality in American history, both during the Great Depression at the end of the 20s and our own economic crisis in the late 2000s till now. But what is compelling about this visualization is that on the line below, these peaks represent moments of the lowest marginal taxation on the wealthy. For us, this is a visualization of the crisis. Because this gap exposes the hypocrisy of the American dream as promised by the dominant mythology of trickle-down economics, that if we lower taxes on the wealthy, all of us benefit. This gap proves the whole mythology wrong. But we never talk about the valley in the middle. I'm glad that we are actually recuperating this uh, diagram because it was an important element of the story in the uh, speech, the opening speech this morning. But we never talk about the valley in the middle where uh, these two lines get closer to each other, creating decades of more equitable uh, distribution of resources. These are the decades organized around FDR's New Deal and uh, a Bill of Rights through which government, civic philanthropy, private sector, universities, and communities mobilized a cross-sector commitment to invest in the public. These decades produce unprecedented public investment in public infrastructure, public art, public education, public housing, public health. In fact, public was not a forbidden word from our political language. This visualization ultimately shows us that inequality is produced by the polarization between private and public interest. And during the next decades, this gap will widen even more and we will witness unprecedented privatization of our public resources. So where is the public today? A society that is anti-tax, anti-public, that is anti-immigrant, and that invests more in building prisons and detention centers for children than in building schools, commits civic suicide. As the top-down public is systematically dismantled, what can we do? Let's imagine a bottom-up public, a set of informal transgressions that counter the imposition of exclusionary political and economic power from everyday acts of resistance in marginalized communities everywhere to our own practices on the ground as cultural producers. Let's design a more stealthful opposition to these anti-public assaults that are descending upon us. What can this bottom-up public look like? Teddy and I would like to share our thoughts on the social, political, and spatial building blocks of a new bottom-up public a sort of bottom-up manifesto. First, enough preaching to the choir. Chances are a majority of us in this room agree on basic principles of inclusion and social equity. But how do we engage those who don't? We need to infiltrate cultures of opposition, understand their logics of justification, and decode today's frightening social and political reality. Events like this one feel great, but we need to get uncomfortable. We need to seek conflict. We need to instigate conflict. We can't underestimate the depth of opposition to inclusion in our society. We need to retool ourselves. Two, change social norms. Let's cultivate new social norms of inclusion and social equity from the bottom up and shame people who violate them. Let's learn, for example, from Antanas Mokus, the legendary mayor of Bogota, Colombia, who understood that law and order does not change hearts and minds. Instead, he fought violence and poverty at Bogota's most intense period of, of civic breakdown by engaging communities, building what he called a new citizenship culture from the bottom up new social norms that unified and transcended the division between us and them. Today, we need a new citizenship culture, unafraid to condemn collectively what's morally and ethically wrong, that xenophobia is wrong, 
that isolationism is wrong, that building border walls is wrong. Let's rethink citizenship beyond the nation state and its obsession with division. The city where we live is divided by a wall. We've committed our practice to constructing a cross-border citizenship culture based on dignity, mutual recognition, and regional interdependence. Third, demand accountability. At a time when the left and the right seem to be converging in their mistrust of government, let's demand accountable public institutions that invest in public goods. The bottom up is resilient and powerful. We know this. But let's not surrender the top down and capitulate to the logics of privatization. Let's not surrender our public rights. In our practice, we believe that the top down and the bottom up need to meet, to share knowledges and resources, and we need agencies capable of mediating their interface. Let's go produce the city. The future of the city depends not only on buildings today, but on the reconfiguration of social and economic relations. Not only private developers should build the city, let's co-produce it with the bottom up. Let's expand access for many other act actors to develop the city and share the profits of urbanization. Let's redefine affordability, in fact, through the value of social participation. We need to elevate the role of communities in co-producing housing, redirecting surplus value to benefit marginalized neighborhoods. This will require the redistribution of knowledges. Social, social justice today cannot be only about the redistribution of resources, but it, it, it should also involve the redistribution of knowledges. We need to translate, in other words, the knowledge of the bottom up and politically represent it in order to transform exclusionary top-down policy. At UCSD, we founded the Cross-Border Community Stations a knowledge exchange platform, a network of field hubs located in underrepresented neighborhoods across the border region, where teaching and research is conducted in collaboration with community partners. They are models for collaborative education, but also a point of entry to co-develop public spaces with our community partners. Through this initiative, we argue that new paradigms of public space are needed to mobilize citizenship through public spaces, and uh, this requires a convening of cross-border, of cross-sector uh, alliances. Summoning fragmented top-down and bottom-up agencies and institutions to share responsibility for public works. In our research, we have learned a lot from Medellin, Colombia, where the city created a cross-sector coalitions a la New Deal to co-develop public spaces and co-produce cultural uh, programming. These coalitions between universities, grassroots organizations, civic philanthropy, for example, were tasked with injecting specific resources into public space, injecting funding to make these spaces sustainable in the long term, uh, protocols of maintenance to in assure inclusion into these uh, spaces, uh, and management, as well as a very sophisticated curatorial programming to make sure that top-down institutions and bottom-up communities could design public spaces and programs simultaneously. Challenge stupid zoning. Zoning has to stop being a punitive tool preventing socialization. Zoning needs to be a generative tool to reorganize activity and economy at community scales. We need to move from the urban logics of consumption to logics of production, because the city has to be more than a zone of consumption. It must become again a site of productivity. We have always seen immigrant neighborhoods as sites of social, economic, and cultural production. Socialized density. Urban density cannot long, can no longer be measured as an abstract amount of buildings or people per area, but as an amount of social and economic exchanges per area. The small social and economic adaptations of bottom-up urbanization will transform the largeness 
of selfish sprawl into more sustainable, plural, and complex environments. Temporalized space. We need to challenge the autonomy of buildings, often conceived as self-referential objects that are indifferent to social and economic temporalities embedded in the city. How to engage, instead, the complex temporalization of space found in informal urbanizations, management of time, people, spaces, and resources simultaneously. For us, the informal is not just an image or an aesthetic. The informal is a praxis. Our urban and uh, political research at the border has been inspired, in fact, by the ingenious strategies of urban adaptation in conditions of scarcity in immigrant communities that flank the border wall. In San Diego, we investigate the positive impact of immigrants in the transformation of the American neighborhood. We work in underrepresented neighborhoods, translating their strategies of urban resilience and retrofit, elevating the creative intelligence of informal urbanization in the production of more complex social and political economies of housing. In Tijuana, we learn from the incremental evolution of spaces as informal settlements in this city develop in layers, recycling the urban waste of San Diego into a sort of second-hand urbanization. This image that you see here is the first gesture of a house in an informal settlement in Tijuana that through time becomes obviously a dwelling. We have always seen these bottom-up alterations of space, economy, and social organization as a more practical and spatial definition of citizenship and democracy. Here is where we ask how to connect top-down resources to support this bottom-up urban creativity. We have been interested in designing small infrastructures, acupunctural infrastructures in many informal settlements to support these temporal dynamics, almost as to suggest the urgency of redefining infrastructure as anticipatory in order to frame the democratization of the city. Democratizing access, the most emblematic image during the civil rights movement is when Rosa Parks sat where she did not belong. Even though the bus was public, it was inaccessible to many. Today, we need to move from our abstract, naive, and selfish ideas of democracy as the right to be left alone. We need to move to the specificity of rights to the city, where democracy is performed in coexistence with others. For us, all of these elements converge in the urgency to transform public space. Let's reject conventional strategies of urban beautification and innovation that turn our public spaces into sites of leisure and consumption. We question the agendas of the, of the creative class and their pop-ups. Too often, they just accelerate gentrification, cynically appropriate arts and culture for private ends, commodify multiculturalism, and become an apology for the absence of more substantial public investment in the city. No, public space must educate. Public space must be a site of debate and contestation and infused with resources and tools that increase public knowledge and cultivate community capacity for political action. And finally, 10, a subject close to our hearts, transgress borders. The hardening of border walls across the world emblematizes a ubiquitous politics of fear and exclusion from Brexit to Fortress Europe to our own US-Mexico border, which has become once again a site of criminalization, closure, and exclusion. We need to tell another story, those of us who live and work in border zones. For one thing, borders are porous things. They cannot contain many informal flows, environmental and hydrological flows, economic flows, normative and cultural flows, ethical and aspirational flows. In this time of global closure, let's amplify what walls cannot contain and demand public recognition of the many interdependencies 
and possible futures in border zones like ours. We want to finish with an image that we just presented at the Venice Architecture Biennale in the US Pavilion. This strange creature is called Mexus, subtitled A Geography of Interdependence. Mexus is an experimental visualization of the entire continental border region that erases the wall, that erases the border. Instead, the line is presented as a thicker system of ecologies shared by Mexico and the United States, watersheds, indigenous and protected lands, and ecological and metropolitan zones, all which are truncated by the jurisdictional line. Mexus provokes a more inclusive idea of citizenship based on coexistence, shared assets, and cooperative opportunities between artificially divided communities. And it makes us wonder about interdependencies in border regions across the world. Over the past years, we've been interested in linking and learning from global border regions. Our political equator project extends a line from the US-Mexico border across the world atlas, forming a corridor of global conflict between the 30 and 38 degrees north parallel. Along this imaginary border lie some of the most contested thresholds in the world, including, of course, our own US-Mexico border at San Diego-Tijuana, the most trafficked border checkpoint in the world, to the Straits of Gibraltar in the Mediterranean, the main funnel of migration from North Africa into fortress Europe, the Israeli-Palestinian border that divides the Middle East and so on, to India-Kashmir, North and South Korea, all along uh, this, this political equator. Border zones are often sites of great human misery and struggle, and the boldest manifestation of state power in our practice over the last decades, we've been committed to telling a very different story about urban life in the US-Mexico border region. We see borders as amazing laboratories for political and urban creativity, for rethinking interdependence and more expansive ideas of citizenship beyond the nation state. Thank you. Thank you. We didn't really plan it this way, uh, but it is thrilling to end with a vision of hope. Um, in a way, the whole Thomas Mann project is, is a vision of hope, that we can still learn from one another in a way that lets us improve the whole. Because our time is so short, instead of going to uh, questions, I'd like Ananya to introduce her graduate students. You're going to inherit the world that uh, we're making right now. And probably we're going to leave most of it for you to fix. Um, and so I want to know what your thoughts are about how to fix it. And so one of the most beautiful things about today has been that we have all shared the stage with our students. And I want to commend um, the organizers for this. So I will let Hilary Malson and Kenton Card, both PhD students in the Department of Urban Planning at UCLA, talk a bit about their work, both their conceptual work and their organizing work, including cultural organizing work, which speaks directly to the theme of expulsions, but as well to the theme of building a different sort of democracy at the scale of the city. So, Hilary. Thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure to join you all today. Um, before I address uh, my, some of my research, I'd like to start uh, by taking a nod from my colleagues in Native Studies and acknowledging the original inhabitants of the land on which you know, we are gathered today, the Tongva people. Um, so if we take a moment to reflect on that, we understand how expulsion is quite literally the, the foundation of, of our built environments and of our systems through, through which we're operating. Um, I'm in my first year in the PhD program in urban planning at UCLA, and so prior to arriving in Los Angeles, I was working at the Smithsonian Institution in my hometown of Washington, D.C., where I was uh, conducting research to support an exhibit 
on neighborhood activism and community organizing and understanding how those practices shape our cities. Um, in one gallery, we focused on the story of one particular neighborhood-based organization uh, called the Adams Morgan Organization, based in the Adams Morgan section of the city. Glad that you're familiar with Adams Morgan. It's a great, great part of town. Um, and in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, this very diverse and not particularly cohesive group of neighborhood residents came together to organize a system of self-governance. Um, and that matters because the city as a whole lacked, uh, lacked uh, its own autonomy. Um, not only in today, where DC residents still lack congressional representation, but also con congressional appointees manage the local government as well. And so these neighbors decided that they could manage their affairs for themselves uh, much more effectively. So through smaller scale things such as park management or larger scale, such as taking over the local public school and creating one of the nation's first community-controlled schools, um, they were able to shape uh, the, their, their place and articulate and exert power over it, articulate a claim to it and exert power over it. Um, what is most impressive about what the Adams Morgan Organization did is that they created the template upon which DC's current uh, current local government is based. So those processes of election and the public accountability structures that they enacted are the foundation of the city's government. Part of what drove those people to design a system of self-governance was their previous histories with expulsion. Uh, that was a neighborhood that had recently changed a lot demographically. And a lot of the folks who had moved in had been expelled from their earlier neighborhoods by uh, the government program known as Urban Renewal. A number of other residents who were active in forming the Adams Morgan Organization uh, were new Americans, recently arrived, having sought asylum, fleeing violence in their own home countries. And so that understanding of expulsion and how it really um, totally dismantles and disrupts ways of life was something they were committed to preventing at all costs by creating their own government. Um, and so I think, you know, to speak to Teddy and Fauna's example of bottom-up strategies, we need to look to how people on the ground are resisting and imagining something greater. Uh, because that's a form of expertise and knowledge around community development and spatial justice that should be the model upon which, you know, we do urban planning um, in our in our nation and our communities at large. Um, and, and we definitely need to incorporate understanding of those histories and of that expertise into our discourses and how we train students. So, thank you. Thank you again um, for inviting me and very inspiring other talks. Um, you know, when I think about the struggle for democracy, I mean, clearly many of these talks have been around rising inequality and the way in which inequality threatens the very foundation of, those, of, of our democracy, different forms of rights and so forth. Underneath that, and always, I think there's a story around resistance to the generation of those inequalities, right? Um, when we talk about the border wall right now and the stripping of children from their parents, it's not as though the Obama administration hadn't also put children in cages. It's not as though we don't have the largest prison population that we, in the world. It's not as though we don't do extrajudicial drone killings internationally. These are forms of status quo generations of radical inequality in a world where we, don't, we have borders, where we have certain citizenship rights, where some folks have due process and others do not. And so I think the stripping of children, the screams, the cry, literally the infant that's nursing being removed, it ruptures so we can, we are, it, it makes visible the invisible forms of inequality that we have that are rampant. And those inequalities, like I'm saying, are threatening forms of democracy. If you look at the great march of return in Gaza right now, it's only making visible these healthcare workers being murdered, making visible decades of inequality. I mention these because I think it's very important for us to be aware when made visible, 
that there are other currents of inequality and that there are other currents of resistance. So I follow specifically tenant movements, tenant struggles around housing insecurity in Berlin and Los Angeles. The particular narrative of housing insecurity in Berlin is often about post-89 reunification of the city and hundreds of thousands of public units being privatized. One group in particular, and of course, this is at the, you know, concurrent with Alternative for Deutschland, Global Shifts Right, one group in Kreuzberg, Berlin, that's particularly powerful in challenging this, forms of inequality, housing insecurity in Germany, in Berlin, in Kreuzberg, it's called Kotti & Co. They are explicitly an anti-racist group and they use a kind of Turkish gekko kondo squatting technique. Actually, funny enough, so I've been researching them for some years and Teddy and Fona have also developed a collaboration a few years ago with them. What they've done, and so just a nod as well, creating a kind of another incremental um, intervention. But they initially used this Gekakonda strategy from the Turkish community that's in Kreuzberg to squat the square and say, we will not leave. Again, kind of through a form of resistance, we will not leave until folks that are on social welfare in Berlin can afford social housing. Jumping to Los Angeles, we have you know, we just had the UN Special Rapporteur here, Philip Alston, a few weeks ago, and I quote, the American dream is rapidly becoming the American illusion. And I quote, the equality of opportunity, which is so prized in theory, is in practice a myth, especially for minorities and especially for women. So we have now in the public awareness in California, in Los Angeles in particular, a housing crisis. And it, again, is a kind of visualization. It's become, it's made visible, something that I would argue has been a long process in the making through the stagnation of wages, a housing bubble, a rising extraction of rents. There's emerged in the last two years in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Tenants Union, and I'm just gonna mention two specific, uh, specific actions, specific um, dramatic kind of events. One the attempted eviction of a tenant, where first, this is an illegal eviction because he's rent controlled, a tenant named Leonardo Sanchez, where first the eviction notice was served and he said, wait, no, I have, he went and saw the eviction defense network. They said, no, you don't have to leave. You have rights to stay. This is an illegal eviction. Then the utilities are cut off. Then construction workers are hired by the owner to attempt to demolish the building while Leonardo is inside, calling the housing department. No response. The construction workers realize what's happening and quickly stop when they realize. They call the landlord, they say, we're done with this job. We're not going to, we're not going to demolish a building with a human inside. The landlord comes with an ax and she starts axing the door down. He says, I'm going to make her do everything that's legally necessary. The housing department's kind of just not clued in when, you call, when they've called them and so forth. So the tenants' union has been organizing around Leonardo. Another excite, I mean, that's a kind of tragic moment, visualizing inequality. You can watch videos on the tenants' union YouTube channel. On the other hand, 93 households are in a rent strike right now at, called Burlington Unidos and they have said they will not pay for an uninhabitable building. And an uninhabitable building is one with rats, one with cockroaches, where one infant had to be hospitalized because they had cockroach bites that had been infected. So they're in court right now with the Eviction Defense Network in political kind of alliance with the Los Angeles Tenants Union trying to put pressure, and they are very much trying to think about forms of co-production, thinking about how can these tenants buy this building? How can they create a mutual housing association, a co-op, and so forth? So I think on, on one end, there's, you know, housing now has kind of risen to the public imaginary. It's become made visible. And yet these kind of underlaying forms of resistance are often present, and yet we're not seeing them. So I just ask that we really be aware and try to be, keep at the forefronts of our brains these different forms of violence, racial violence, gender violence, 
and inequality and the forms of resistance at the grassroots level, because I think those really inform how we might create a more radical, egalitarian, democratic society. So thank you so much. It breaks my heart that the timing is such that we can't turn this into discussion now. Uh, it does point to the future we have to have together. Um, I do want to make just a couple of brief concluding comments. Uh, one of the things Thomas Mann wrote in The Coming Victory of Democracy is that in a democracy, artistic work and research is not separated from life and held at a distance, but it is brought close uh, to the realities of, of life. One of the things I think our country actually has suffered from is huge parts of the university community have withdrawn uh, from, they study the issues of the world, but have with, withdrawn from the belief that they can act on them. One of the things we've seen here today, which is I find quite thrilling, is people using the, oper the privilege of our great universities to conduct the most serious research and not find it as separate from acting in the communities they work in uh, around the world. Uh, this, this really brings the hopes of Thomas Mann and the hopes of the Thomas Mann House uh, together with examples of, of what is possible. The other thing I wanna say is that, well, the press doesn't cover it very well Right now in America, there are, there are efforts toward redemocratization going on everywhere. Uh, everywhere. Uh, some of it we see in the organizing about midterm elections. But it goes deeper than that in communities across the country as people realize what we're at risk of losing, uh, organizing uh, in a way <laughs> from the bottom, from the middle, and from the, from the economic top to say we, we have to re-engage and it's up to us uh, to, uh, well, to put it bluntly, to save us from uh, the encroaching demise of a democracy that for all its flaws uh, has also brought great possibilities into the world. It is still our best hope. I thank you all for being with us today. You're gonna to find yourselves on, if, if you gave us email addresses, you're gonna find yourselves on email list. And uh, this is just the beginning. Thank you.